Hello, welcome to our lecture series for the Law of Equity and Trust. My name is Aibo Kayo, and today I'll be taking you through our fourth lecture, which is our part two on equitable remedies. Today, we shall focus on specific performance, equitable uh, estoppel, rescission, and rectification as those equitable remedies that may be used where damages offers insufficient relief to the plaintiff. Um, so welcome, let us uh, look into the fleshy aspect of these uh, topics and we shall start with specific performance. Now, as you may recall, specific performance comes after injunction as one of the equitable remedies that we discussed in our previous seminar. So, um, with regards to specific performance, this is just an order of the court uh, to one party in a contractual obligation compelling them to act on their contractual bargain. So, it's just an order of the court which uh, requires a party to honor their contractual obligation. This specific order, it's a, a remedy which operates in personam, meaning the order goes directly to an individual person so long as they are within the jurisdiction of the court. And um, it's uh, irrelevant if the subject matter of that particular contract, it is outside the court's jurisdiction. Um, historically, this specific performance came in as a remedy uh, on matters or rather contracts related to the sale of land. So it came in uh, to remedy a situation where a defendant uh, may get away on the matters with regards to the sale of land, especially uh, putting an emphasis that land um, has a special interest on the purchaser and if allowed to get away uh, with it, then the purchaser might, to the largest extent, not uh, receive a compen um, compensation as adequate remedy to their uh, bargain. So when we are looking at specific performance vis-a-vis -vis the damages, um, which the court may award, the court looks at it as a discretionary remedy uh, that is a specific performance and can only be applicable where um, damages offers no um, sufficient relief to the plaintiff. Now, what are those particular situations uh, where a court may be drawn to issue an order of specific performance? We shall be looking at these particular situations one after the other. So we shall start with the contract for the sale of um, a land um, as one of those uh, strict areas that uh, a court may issue a specific performance order to a party. As already mentioned to you earlier, um, the onus lies to the defendant to establish why such an order or specific performance may be refused. If they do not, then the court will assume that um, um, uh, or rather the court will try to protect the interests of the purchaser who may deem this land as a unique um, and valuable to those particular purchasers. So the land will be uh, given back to, uh, rather the land will be passed to the purchaser where the court deems that um, compensation will not offer an adequate remedy. 
what does the court therefore look at when uh, uh, determining the specific performance with regards to the contract for the sale of land? So the first thing is that the parties must have agreed uh, in principle and uh, in facts on every, um, um, on the terms of those uh, or that that particular contractual obligation. So there must be mutuality uh, of the parties, and the contract is valid, and also the um, consideration has been offered by the parties. So where that is visible, a court may offer a specific performance as a remedy to enforce a contract for the sale of land. Also, the court must uh, uh, satisfy itself that the statutory uh, compliance requirements were fulfilled. Um, so in this regard, uh, for example, in Kenya, the Land Act requires that um, a contract for the sale of land must be in writing. And in doing so, the parties uh, must ensure that they have documented this agreement so that the court may uh, assist them uh, with specific performance in case there was a violation on that contract for the sale of land. Now, in as much as the Land Act provides for uh, this statutory compliance that there must be uh, a written agreement between the parties with regards to the sale of land, there is no specific format that uh, a party may have to follow. So what is mostly uh, relevant to the court is that the parties fulfill the three P's um, for them to deem this contract as um, a statutory compliant contract. So there must be that agreement which uh, parties have agreed in all aspects and then also that the property to be sold is also available uh, or rather um, the property in contention is known uh, precisely and also the price which was to be paid or which has been paid is known um, to the court. So once the court has this kind of um, uh, three P's, the parties, the property and the price, then it will deem that statutory compliance um, requirements were met by the parties uh, in writing. Um, so once the court has established that, then it can issue an order of specific performance. Now, what about where the parties have not written down uh, those aspects. There is now the second uh, doctrine, which is the doctrine of part performance, which comes in where parties have not uh, perhaps uh, documented or uh, uh, written down the agreement or followed uh, some procedural aspect of uh, statutory requirement with regards to uh, the sale of land or any other contractual obligation. So, as you remember from our, our second chapter, which was on maxims of equity, we remember a saying that um, the uh, that equity will not allow a statute to be used as an instrument of fraud. And here, remember that the Land Act will be used to prevent a party uh, uh, who is asserting rights on uh, property like land by saying, see, they did not write it down, so there can be no proper agreement. So in that instance, the doctrine of part performance comes in to show if one of the parties um, did their part of the obligation as so required to fulfill uh, this contractual bargain. So if one party already did a section or um, rather performed their part of obligation, then the court will say that um, the other uh, defendant should also uh, fulfill their part 
of obligation. So that is the doctrine of part performance. In case law, we have Lori versus Reed case, which is of course an old case, but it has uh, a necessary uh, explanation that we may require. Uh, a mother promised a son that uh, it should give uh, the, his own farm to another uh, brother. And then if they did so, then uh, the mother would write a will um, uh, to give uh, the other property to uh, this uh, first son who gave away their land. Um, after their death, uh, after the mother's death, it was visible that um, uh, the, the, the son who gave away their land uh, um, had not been featured as it could have been in the will. So the court said the son had performed their part of obligation by moving their title of the land to the brother. And as such, um, the mother should, was um, not, or, or rather did not do it properly to um, refuse to honor their part of the promise. So the court came in and said the part uh, performance doctrine was fulfilled when uh, a son gave away the land to the brother. Um, so, so we also have um, another part, uh, another case law, which uh, is very instrumental for us to look at in relation to the same part performance. Um, the court looks at part performance in this regard uh, to have been met only if these a few um, conditions have been established by the parties. So the first one is that there must be a concluded contract, oral contract. In the previous case, remember, the mother and the son had concluded a contract, uh, although it was an oral contract. Then there must be an intention to perform that contract by the plaintiff. So the plaintiff in that regard was the son, and he tried to perform uh, their part of the obligation. So that intention to perform that contract is very important. Then the defendant must have either induced uh, or assented to those acts uh, to be performed by the uh, plaintiff. So the mother induced, or in other words, um, uh, agreed or assented to those acts to let the son give away their land. And also, the court looks at unquestionable behavior, uh, which may be done in breach of good faith. So if it is just an questionable behavior where somebody is retracting or uh, trying to run away from their contractual obligation, then the court may um, issue an order of specific performance uh, to let them uh, fulfill their contractual obligation. Another um, aspect uh, on this uh, specific performance, the third aspect of it is the contract requiring supervision. So generally, a contract which requires uh, continuous supervision are not uh, enforceable by way of specific performance. However, a court may still find uh, a way to um, enforce these uh, contracts which may require um, supervision uh, um, in his, his specific circumstances. The rationale behind the court's apprehension to uh, fulfill, I mean rather to compel parties to fulfill uh, a contract which may require a continuous uh, supervision by the court is that supervision may not be practical and it will be very difficult to make uh, sure that 
the defendant um, um, the defendant complies with the order it is itself. So the the defendant is likely uh, to fail um, to, to to fail in honoring of obligation with regards to uh, that particular uh, contract if supervision is uh, required continually. So the court may not be uh, in position to keep on um, uh, compelling or rather supervising a party to comply with a particular obligation. So if it requires too much of that supervision, kind of, then the court will not uh, issue a specific performance order. Um, we have a case of uh, Cooperative Insurance Society versus Agile Stores. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff granted a 35-year uh, lease to the defendants of a unit in a shopping center. The lease contained a covenant which obliged the tenant to keep the premises open for, a, for trade during normal business hours. The tenant subsequently decided to close its uh, supermarket business and duly shut up that shop. The Lord Hoffman, uh, in determining that particular case, um, stated that that order um, of specific performance must have sufficient precision so as to avoid wasteful litigation. So it must be very precise that this is the order that is going to uh, be performed and that order should not require a continuous supervision because it risks the defendant uh, from contact of court um, if they do not fulfill that particular um, court order. We also have um, contracts to build or repair um, a, a premise. As such, contracts generally are also not able to attract an order of specific performance. But of course, we have some circumstances where that order of specific performance may be uh, granted by the court. Um, of course, as always, um, it's um, deemed that uh, damages will normally be adequate uh, remedy uh, in areas of um, um, in, uh, or rather in contract relation to building or construction because you can always hire another contractor or um, another builder to come and complete the works which have been abandoned or left behind by the other party. There are exceptions, however, to the extent to which this general rule may uh, uh, still not, uh, I mean, where the, we may depart from this general rule as an exception uh, to the contracts to build and repair. So in the case of um, Wolverhampton Corporation versus Emmons, the court held that um, specific performance contract may be granted provided that the building or repair works are defined precisely and so specific that the court it itself may know which um, um, which which part of that particular contract is to be performed precisely. So let's say you are constructing a building and the only thing which is left on that particular building um, is maybe roofing. So the specific aspect of it is roofing and roofing um, maybe with regards to uh, putting iron sheet or, or whichever way you're doing. Or say uh, the specific performance on that particular building is only to insert or to fit windows and doors on that building. So that is very precise and well defined that the court may not be left wondering what um, 
uh, is, is specifically to be performed. And in fact, the court will deny uh, will deny this uh, specific performance remedy where it deems that the uh, task to be performed is not precise enough that may leave the defendant wondering what exactly they ought to do. Um, also, the the court established in the in, in the court established in that case that the claimant must have a substantial interest uh, in having the contract performed, and that interest must not be capable of being compensated by way of damages. Of course, the defendant should also have uh, the permission uh, or the possession of the land in question or the place which is um, in question where the contract is going to be performed. Um, so we, we have another... Uh, we have another aspect of this, which is uh, the contract for personal services. So what happens where there are contracts where people are offering their services uh, with regards to fulfillment or rather the court's remedy on specific performance. So generally, a court will not uh, grant um, an order of specific performance where uh, personal services are involved. Uh, the rationale behind this is that the, the court will not force someone to work against their own wishes. So the court will not turn um, a contract of service into a contract of slavery as it was held in um, D. Francesco versus Barnum, a case of 1890. Um, also, where you've hired a musician or um, uh, a comedian to come on stage and perform, uh, you may, if they fail to perform or they delay to come, uh, or rather, forfeit this particular contractual obligation, you may not ask the court to come and compel them so they can fulfill this part of their bargain. Um, and that was a case which was in Ashworth versus Royal National Theatre of 2014. Um, so the court there say that it will be very difficult and unfair to require an employer who has wrongfully dismissed an employee to take them back to work. So in that particular regard, then the contract uh, which uh, relates to the personal services may not receive specific performance as an equitable remedy by the court. So, oh, what are the defenses to specific performance itself? So, if somebody is saying, I mean, rather, uh, and the plaintiff is approaching the court and telling the court that um, um, uh, to compel the defendant to act, the defendant may come up with uh, these defenses to say, no, uh, look, it is not practical for. Um, the court to compel me to specifically perform my part of the obligation. So one of those um, uh, defenses is the lack of mutuality. If parties did not agree on all aspects of the uh, contract itself, then uh, the court may um, uh, not issue specific performance um, against a defendant. Also, where there was a mistake, uh, the remember mistake with relation to the contract. So if the mistake is too serious to, um, uh, 
to invalidate a contract or um, that no contract uh, may be deemed to have come into an existence. And then clearly uh, in that kind of circumstances, then an order or specific performance may not be made. Also, we have another defense, which is represent misrepresentation. So where a party misrepresented in that particular contract, then an order of specific performance may not be issued by the court. When looking at misrepresentation, uh, whether it's fraudulent or innocent misrepresentation, it is a very important that you understand that that particular misrepresentation must have um, must be uh, 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 one which we cannot is not so serious to the extent that um, a plaintiff may be justified to rescind from that particular contract. Also, uh, that misrepresentation must have induced the defendant to enter into that particular contractual obligation, and as such, the defendant. Um, I mean, the, 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 the plaintiff, um, uh, uh, the, the, the plaintiff made the defendant to suffer prejudice uh, as a result of that reliance on that contract. Remember, the defendant is the one bringing this defense and saying, now look, this misrepresentation was here. The, the, the plaintiff uh, induced me to enter into this contractual obligation. And as such, uh, that inducement has costed me to suffer um, a, a prejudice as a result of uh, that inducement. And then the court will look at that misrepresentation as a defense and it will not issue an order to compel this defendant to pa perform the other part of bargain uh, under specific performance at the remedy. Also, we have um, uh, the, the doctrine of latches and or delay. I remember looking at this in our previous uh, uh, lecture. Um, so generally, the, the doctrine of latches, remember, it's in relation of lapse of time or time limitations, and then, then, then we have the delay. If one party has uh, delayed uh, to perform the part of the obligation, then, um, uh, then by the virtue of that time uh, delays, the court may uh, issue specific performance. However, that delay must be unreasonable delay, not just any type of delay. And um, uh, and as such, if it's an unreasonable delay, it is on the part of the plaintiff to demonstrate that the delay was uh, very uh, unreasonable. And as such, they are to suffer harm should this remedy or specific performance not be um, compelled against the defendant. So sometimes when parties also enter into a contractual obligation, they might uh, specify on which deadlines or uh, debts that uh, a contract should be performed by then. If parties have put that into their contractual uh, bargain, then we shall deem that as the date at which after its expiry, then specific performance uh, uh, may be sought by one party to compel the other party to honor the part of the bargain. Also, we have um, another defense of hardship. Um, so this hardship is with relation to the hardship occasioned on the defendant. So if this order or specific performance, um, if it is granted, then it will cause or inflict unreasonable hardship on the defendant, then the court may be apprehensive with regard to uh, awarding uh, specific performance as a remedy to the plaintiff. 
also where there is um, illegality or public policy, uh, it may be a defense to the defendant who may say uh, that, uh, look, if I fulfill this part of the obligation, um, then it will be contrary to the public policy or perhaps its performance, it is um, on an illegal or immoral contract kind of. So let's say, for example, a contract uh, to pay for stolen goods or uh, a contract which, if performed, will offend the public policy, um, then the court will not issue that kind of uh, remedy or specific performance. In uh, Ward versus Tyler, a 1974 case, uh, the court deemed that um, the order of specific performance may be refused where, um, where a husband will be forced to sue a wife uh, to whom they are residing with. So if uh, the, 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 this uh, defendant is to be um, compelled to perform their part of obligation, then it means that they will be uh, doing uh, that they'll be suing, which is against the public policy on one not suing the uh, partner or the the, 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 the companion. Um, another defense that uh, the defendant might come up with is uh, um, impossibility and uh, frustration of uh, that contract. So if that contract had been uh, rendered impossible to be performed, or it has been um, uh, frustrated, then this remedy will not be available to the uh, plaintiff. Let's say, for example, one hires um, uh, a hall uh, for uh, or a theater hall uh, for performances, and then that hall is banned a day before uh, uh, is is banned a day before the performance is even done. So that will have already frustrated that particular contract and as such uh, the defendant will not be um, uh, compelled by the court for them to honor that particular contractual obligation in the case of ferguson versus wilson a uh, specific performance of a contract to allot shares was refused because the shares had been validly allotted to existing shareholders uh, before equitable remedy was sought. So this was already done. It was impossible to go back and write off the shares of the other existing shareholders to uh, bring about uh, remedy to this particular plaintiff. So in that kind of regard, that impossibility alone warrants the court not to give this specific performance. Lastly, a uh, specific performance will also be given on the where a contract has uh, also fulfilled all the other parts of the contractual uh, elements, including consideration. So where um, apparent perhaps uh, uh, promises uh, another part, I mean, the, the parent uh, promises um, uh, maybe a daughter uh, to give them something, and in, with regard, no consideration has been provided by different parties, then uh, the court will not enforce such kind of obligation. Remember, the, the first case that I cited, uh, where a son uh, uh, and, a, and a mother um, agreed in principle on a transfer of land from the son to another son that uh, shows that there was a consideration from this son who is the plaintiff in that case. So there must be a consideration. And remember, the consideration is something of value in exchange flowing from both parties. And as we remember from our equitable maxims, that equity will not assist a volunteer. So if you provided uh, if you entered into a contractual obligation without uh, providing for consideration, then equity will not assist you because it will be deemed as if 
you did it voluntarily. With that, now I welcome you to our third remedy, which is estopel. Um, under this, um, estopel refers to that principle which um, uh, the, the court, um, or rather the term estopel refers to the legal principle that prevents someone from going back from their promise or what they had made a representation to the other party that is this is our position so a party will be stopped uh, from going back from their promise or asserting um, uh, rights on another uh, another's property so uh, estopel basically looks at what the parties uh, had agreed. Remember, in most cases, uh, with estopel, there is normally an obligation which is in existence. And as such, parties get inferences or representation from the other parties that um, they, they, that um, uh, they, they are contractual position um, or rather the, the contractual position may be varied by way of that representation or that statement. So I will look into these kinds and uh, break it down quite so that it can be easier for you to understand but just from this particular PowerPoint slide I want you to understand that estopel is just precluding a party from going back from their own original uh, promise. So we have different types of uh, estopels, um, and uh, those are normally categorized based on how they are used by the court to award the remedy to the plaintiff. So we have um, uh, what we call um, estopel by representation, which is the biggest of all, I guess, uh, from um, uh, based on my readings. This kind of estopel, it has two major branches, which is the promissory estopel and proprietary estopel. And so those two jointly are called um, reliance-based estopel. Why are they called reliance-based uh, estopel? Is because a party relies on representation which was made by uh, the, 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 the defendant, and then the defendant are trying to run away from those representations, and then the court will stop them from running away from those representations. We also have um, estoppel by record. We also have estoppel by silence, uh, and also um, estoppel by delay or latches, and also estoppel uh, which we call issue estoppel, and many, many others, because there's so many factions of this estoppel depending on circumstances under which you wish to invoke this estoppel to act on your favor. So I will just um, highlight on two types of estoppel here because they're not in the slides. I didn't find it uh, very um, helpful to include them by virtue of how they are. So estoppel by record, we might have this as a, um, that type of estoppel where you find that, uh, let's say, one has been convicted. It is on the record. There's no um, way we can argue that. It's on the record that this person has already been tried on this issue or this person has been convicted for this. So it is on the record. So the other party will be stopped if they went into what has already been put uh, uh, like uh, which has already been finalized. So the record will have already shown that you look, this person has already been tried. Another thing, uh, for example, another example I mean for estoppel by record would be I have a legal title to this property. I have this uh, document of um, um, title deed to demonstrate that I am the legal title owner of this property. So the other party will be stopped that you see 
you are trying to purport the ownership. Where is your document? So the record shows that this particular person is the one who is the owner of this property. Another estoppe that I did not discuss in the slide, I just wish also to echo it here, is the silence, uh, estoppel by silence or acquiescence. So if you did not say a word, you kept quiet within that period of time, you saw things happening, you did not raise any alarm to say that your rights are being infringed upon or they are likely to be infringed upon, then the court may issue uh, um, um, the, the court may not issue you as a plaintiff that this a type of remedy which is called estoppel by silent or acquiescence. So if you kept quiet, then the law will not uh, assist you. Remember our equitable maxim that um, equity will only uh, favor the vigilant. So you must always be vigilant where your right is likely to be infringed upon, you should always raise it uh, to the defendant. So if you wait for so long, then it will be very difficult for you uh, to get this remedy. Also, delay. Uh, perhaps if you took so long to delay, uh, then the estoppel will not assist you as the plaintiff. So the defendant will say, that, look, time has gone. Ever since this happened, they did not raise it, so uh, they should be stopped from raising it again. With that, I will move forward to reliance-based estoppels because this one, this one's are quite uh, um, uh, complex and that requires more uh, discussion. So with the reliance-based estoppels, as I already said, there must be a statement which was relied upon by the other party. So that statement might have been said or uh, a representation and done to show that uh, the, this particular party, this particular party um, um, ought to change their legal position based on that. So we have two categories of these. We have the promissory estoppel, uh, where a person makes a promise to another, but there is no um, an enforceable contract at that time. Remember, there's this, this one thing uh, perhaps I will wish to shed light here, that um, estoppel comes in where there's already an existing contract. I already mentioned that. But also, estoppel is not on its own a cause of action just like injunction in other remedies. You cannot go to court and say, look, um, I, 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 want, I want to sue somebody uh, because of the promise they gave me, and uh, that is estoppel. That's why it is said that estoppel acts as a shield, but not as a sword. So you cannot sue somebody based on estoppel, but you can always uh, defend yourself using estoppel. So with this, the, 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 the person um, who makes um, a promise to another will only be precluded uh, from uh, denying what they promised. But you cannot sue somebody based on that promise because there was a contractual obligation first before this new promise was made. So there must be the first promise, which was the contract itself. Now we have the new promise, which is relied upon by one party to change their legal position. I will explain much on that. We also have proprietary estoppel, which emanated basically because of uh, land uh, matters, um, where uh, if a party... Um, uh, let's say, either um, is uh, fighting on, over the title of that property uh, through maybe inheritance or uh, maybe they bought the land and that land is in question. Then proprietary estoppel will be uh, trying to estop a party who may want to act unconscionably or 
at some point, they may compel a party. Um, um, they may compel a party to honor the part of obligation uh, and to be stopped from denying that they made a specific representation or they uh, said specific words that were relied upon by the plaintiff. So all reliance-based estoppels require a victimized party to show both inducement to enter into that contract and then detriment, uh, the, there's a detriment which was is likely to be suffered or has been suffered by reliance on that promise. When is representation then relied upon? Uh, the representation is relied upon if it is so substantial to the extent that it may um, uh, is likely to change the position. <coughs> Sorry, it's likely to change uh, the position of the other party. So, the of course the defenses in relation to the contract law misrepresentation applies here uh, fully. So, if you converse with those misrepresentation uh, defenses, uh, they will be very helpful when you're looking at uh, that representation it itself. Now, so we've talked a bit about the promissory estoppel, but what is it exactly? So promissory estoppel, um, it is um, this type of estoppel that it precludes a party who is already in a contractual a relationship which is in existence, um, it precludes those uh, the, the, the party from going back from their new promise. So let's look at it this way. There was the first promise, which is the actual contract that parties have to act ABCD. Then after that a period of time, another new promise comes in from another party uh, from, from, from uh, uh, yeah, one of the parties and say uh, you should act ABCD or if you acted in that other way then it will be okay to me. So that representation is relied upon by the other party to change their legal obligation. An example can be this. You live in a three bedroom house which you renting um uh, maybe let's say it's a lease agreement uh, for one year. You stayed in that uh, uh, building for some time, and then one of the bedrooms uh, need uh, serious repair because it, the, the rooftop is leaking when it's uh, rainy uh, during rainy seasons. So you talk to your landlord and Lando agrees to rectify that mistake and tells you because of this situation, um, you will live in this uh, apartment or in this building, but you, you're you not going to be paying for this month. Uh, I mean, for the, the next three months for this particular uh, problem, I need to remove the entire roof and reseal it. But I'm giving you an alternative. You're leaving this building you're going to my other block where you'll be staying meanwhile as I repair this. So for the next three months, you're not going to be paying for the rent. Now, this tenant agrees to leave the building, to go to another block, and uh, but only to return once this building has been repaired. If this tenant agrees to leave the building and left and went uh, to the other um, uh, block, it means they changed their legal position. First, their legal position meant that they, this particular building where they are living, uh, where they used to be, the one which is leaking, is where they're supposed to be. That's one. Two, another obligation there was for them to pay the monthly rent but the defendant has said remove this rent uh i mean i'll remove this rent 
and then uh, uh, you will not be paying for three months. So within that three months, somebody has changed their legal position and they are relying on that promise not to pay. So the defendant cannot go back and say, no, 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 no. pay back those three months. They will be stopped by the court and say, you cannot go back onto that promise. And then it will be enforced. You don't need to show detrimental uh, aspect of it, that there was a detriment uh, when you relied on that promise. But so long as you change your legal position, and that is enough to uh, warrant the court to stop the other uh, party. Um, so the party who is uh, aggrieved will uh, stop the other party from going back uh, 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 going back from their original uh, position. So estopel, estopel will be stopping a party from going back uh, from the second promise, remember that. Not the first promise, which was that contract agreement itself. So if there was that contract agreement already in existence, of course, then they will be stopped from the new promise, not the original contract. In um, case law, the promissory estoppel has been pronounced and the locus classica case here is uh, the Central London Property Trust versus High Tree, uh, um, commonly known as the High Tree case. In this case, there were uh, there was a, a lease agreement on a block, uh, uh, which was which was uh, 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 High Tree um, rented or rather leased that uh, uh, blocks those blocks before the World War. So when World War came, the blocks were almost empty. They were half empty, rather. And then the high tree went to the landlord and told the landlord uh, uh, they were intending to terminate their lease agreement. The landlord affirms and says, uh, you can pay half of what you've been paying so long as we keep the lease agreement going. Now, the high tree decides to maintain and they also lower the, the price for the uh, tenants halfway. So the tenants did not leave because the price was good. Now the court uh, uh, came in to uh, stop uh, the, the, the Central London Property uh, Trust when they tried to ask for that period after the blocks were reoccupied after the World War. So they were stopped that, no, you cannot ask for that half uh, cash which you reduced during the time of war. So the they, 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 they estoppel only happened for them going back to the second promise, but High Tree was supposed to go back to the original uh, uh, lease agreement to pay that money, which was uh, originally agreed. So they could not pay uh, during the time when the new promise had been given. That's the only time when they were precluded from paying that half of the price for the lease. I hope that is understandable. And um, uh, so the high tree case established the four major principles. I will just mention them, that there must be a significant promise which uh, has been made and that promise must have been acted upon by one of the parties. And also, as uh, acting upon, of course, that's the reliance on that promise, it led to um, uh, change of the legal position. And as such, a party suffered damage or detriment by relying on that promise, not necessarily that they must have to suffer. In some cases, they say, so long as there's that reliance to change that particular obligation. And then that uh, particular uh, um, promise is the fulfillment of it is the only way uh, you can um, compensate uh, the I, I mean brother uh, uh, the promise will be uh, only fulfilled uh, by way of estoppel and not any other 
remedy like uh, damages. So in that regard, Estopel will come in to um, uh, to uh, preclude a party from going back from their other promise that they made after the contract came into existence. So uh, what about the proprietary Estopel? So um, with regards to proprietary Estopel, um, the basis of this Estopel is to prevent a person from insisting strictly on his or her legal rights, where to do so would be inequitable, uh, having regard to the dealings which have taken place between the parties. And as such, if a party relied on that assurances, maybe let's say the land, somebody relied on those insurances, and then that reliance on those insurances are cause them detriment, then it will be um, unfair for uh, the court to allow them to get away with it unquestionably. So the court will uh, stop such a party from denying existence of such kind of representation. In Re Basham uh, case of 1986, the court stated that where one person A has acted to his detriment on the faith of a belief which was known to add, uh, um, which was known to and encouraged by another person B, that he either has or is going to be given a right in or over this property, B cannot insist on his strict uh, legal rights if to do so will be inconsistent with S belief. So a party will be uh, stopped. And now in Will, will Mott versus Baba establish those uh, requirements to be fulfilled for the promissory estoppel to be applicable. And remember, they are quite similar to those which uh, are there in high tree case as I already uh, talked about. So we also have other types of uh, 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 estoppels where we have um, um, we have uh, other than reliance based estoppels that I've explained in details. We also have uh, equitable estoppels and this specifically is an a US approach that uh, lays down uh, the elements which must be fulfilled and that's uh, uh, the, the part of misrepresentation like we just said or concealment of information uh, the knowledge of the true facts uh, we have the fraudulent intention we have inducement and reliance on to that then the injury or the detriment uh, to the complainant. So that's how the US approach takes it. It's quite very similar to the UK approach. Now, another one we have the issue estoppel. And under this, uh, a person who is going through a litigation may not uh, be enforced i mean uh, uh, may, may not may not suffer a second uh, litigation on the same issue if that issue has already been settled by the court so um any court uh, of justice uh, will be always be prepared uh not to issue um an order of estoppel or rather uh, to to Will, will will not compel a party to reappear on the same same issue which they have already uh, been tried upon even if it means it is with the different parties at that time when that issue is coming on board so uh, issue estoppel is just um, based on the issue which the court is uh, uh, the, the, somebody is approaching the court with it can be with regards to that particular contract 
or it can be even in criminal matters or any other matter so long as you can identify that this issue has already been tried by the court. Now, other than this um, estopel, which is our third remedy, we also have rectification um, as an equitable remedy. And under this rectification, um, as, all, as we already stated, it's a discretionary remedy, which um, tries to make an amend on uh, the instrument, the contractual instrument. If left as it is, then it will be uh, so difficult uh, to uh, understand the actual intention of the parties to that contract. So you might find um, maybe the parties say the buyer shall pay, uh, I mean the seller shall pay the buyer. In the other, it's supposed to be the other way around, that the buyer shall pay the seller. If so, then rectification is a remedy to that and the court will come in to say, no, let's rectify such statement to mean the intention of the parties. Remember, this is an exception to the parole rule where if it, um, an agreement has been documented or put in writing, then an oral evidence is not admissible to that extent. Rectification comes in to correct the errors or the mistakes which have been uh, 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 inserted in that uh, contractual draft and there are so obvious errors to, to permit the court to rectify that particular mistake. So that mistake, it must be a, um, uh, a mistake uh, mostly of both parties, or even if it's just for one party, but it has to be uh, of a serious nature and so obvious to uh, give the court that uh, discretion to rectify it. Remember, the court does not rectify the contract itself. It only rectifies the error in that particular contract. So rectification in the case law, we have uh, McKinsey versus Colson, where the court uh, um, summarizes that courts of equity do not rectify contracts. They may and do rectify instrument purporting to have been made in a person uh, of the terms of the contract. So it's just a statement within the contract, but not the contract itself. Because remember, the contract is only done by the two parties. However, in uh, Whiteside versus Whiteside, uh, a case of 1950, the court said that when they are exercising this particular discretion on rectification, the court must be so cautious and must guard this uh, rectification jealously because it is not their place to rectify contracts. Rather, they can only rectify an obvious error within the contract. Um, so finally, we have here uh, rescission, which is an, another equitable remedy. And uh, rescission, it's uh, that uh, equitable remedy that permits a party to rescind from a contractual obligation, or rather to set it aside that contract or to void that contract. So the party will rescind from it. That's rescission. They say this contract, we cannot uh, deem it as if it was in existence. Let us uh, avoid it. Let us uh, uh, set it aside so that we no, none of the parties will be forced to perform its uh, obligations. Um, the, the, the court is the only uh, umpire which can rescind an existing contract. And as such, party who requires rescission as a remedy must apply to court uh, to ask the court to rescind from that particular contract. Once the court has seen this uh, in merit of that particular uh, uh, application and sees it's viable for it to um, avoid the party, uh, rather to avoid that contract and treat it as rescinded, then um, 
the contract will be treated as it as if it was void ab initio. So we shall deem that this contract was invalid from its inception. Um, so there are grounds to uh, there are grounds to uh, be followed, uh, uh, or rather to be raised by a defendant in that matter when one is applying for rescission, and that is uh, the grounds for equitable rescission, which includes misrepresentation. Remember, misrepresentation is a um, is a, one of the vitiating factors, uh, and actually all of these are vitiating factors on a contract. So if we can uh, find that we have these vitiating factors of misrepresentation or mistake or undue influence or duress or perhaps uh, uh, unconscionable transaction and all those kind of vitiating factors of a contract, then um, the court might uh, order uh, rescission for the parties. But rescission, it is exercised um, cautionably. It's not always automatic that a court will give you. With that, uh, thank you very much. We are at the end of this uh, equitable remedy. And next week, we shall be looking at our uh, fifth uh, lecture uh, topic, which is the uh, trust. So next week, we shall be looking at uh, trust, uh, specifically all, all those um, elements uh, that relate to uh, trust, how it's formed, and how um, it's likely to be honored. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And let us meet in the lecture the seminar with any question that emanate from this. And please endeavor to read the other lecture materials that have been provided for you uh, before the seminar lecture uh, this coming week. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you understood this lecture.